the topic that I want to share today um, is mind over matter and does it really matter? You know, uh, some of the earlier speakers have touched on neuroscience. We saw one of the videos. We spoke about artificial intelligence. So hey, we are in the age of the brain. But this is just about five, maybe seven years old. The search to understand the nature of the human mind, however, is centuries old. And if you look at science today, um, and if you consider matter and you consider mind, I think we will all agree that science has got a good handle on matter, more or less, right? We have Newton's laws, we have quantum mechanics, we have chemistry, we have tissue engineering, we have general engineering, computers, you name it. A lot of matter. Uh, how much everything matters is a thing for debate, but a lot around matter. But when it comes to the mind, there's a lag. Science hasn't been able to really, in a convincing manner, get a handle on it. And that may be because, so far, we didn't have the tools to see and measure, because that's how science works. On the other hand, all of us are really, really amazed at stories, like many of the stories you heard and saw today. Stories where people have struggled um, against amazing odds and created success stories, right? I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, somebody mentioned. Um, you could have a Lee Kuan Yew. You um, could have a Rafael Nadal or an Usain Bolt. Fabulous stories. And one thing stands out, oh, these guys, the mind, right? I mean, if you see somebody like Nadal or somebody play, you will know how much of a role that particular element plays. But we also know that he has been beset with injuries for a long time in his career, right? So we're all amazed with mind over matter stories. And so let me tell you why I chose the subject and asked all this all of you this question, does it really matter? And in order to explain that, I want to share a personal story and how some of the research work that myself and my colleague John, who's sitting here, went through in Singapore. So the year was 1998, sometime in the middle. And I was driving from Mumbai in India to a city which is about 170 kilometers away. And this happened. This is not my car. This is just something I found on Google, which looked something like what my car looked like after the accident, OK? You can see it's head on. You can see it's on the driver's side. And so you know, one minute, I was a successful businessman. I was a national level athlete. I was a new father, and the next moment, everything seems to have changed. After six months or so of coming to know that I have severe injuries physically, I have brain injuries, and things like that, doctors sort of gave up on me. They said, look, you've got to get on with your life. And when that happened, it got me thinking, because I had nothing to lose. There was a whole lot of other things that I could try out before I gave up. On one hand, every time I tried to get up and walk, the body would give up on me. And then when I used to try and think and figure out a way, the mind would get hazy and shut down. And this you know, went on for some time. It was an amazing mix and a very confusing mix. And slowly, as I spent those days, it became more and more evident to me how the mind and the body affect and sabotage each other, right? I still remember I used to get up in the morning, take my crutches, and use all my willpower. You know, I was a sportsman, so I was very proud of my willpower. And by the time I was at the door, the body was so tight and twisted, and I was breathing so heavily that the brain just shut down. And that, that was the end of my willpower. And I used to just get down on the floor, or if I was lucky, go to the nearby chair. 
And this went on for some months until a guy, a physiotherapist, came and told me this. He said, the chances of you walking again are really slim. Your willpower is too strong. And this got me really mad. I said, what rubbish is this guy talking? This is the only thing I have to work with, and he's telling me I have to let it go? Anyway, after I'd calmed down a bit, and in one of those moments when you're lying exhausted, looking at the ceiling, wonder, wondering what's going to come next, I started thinking. I said, what if I start listening to my body a little more? What if I, I'm kind to my body a little more and not using my mind to push it all the time? Can something change? And my mind went back to my training, which was in yoga and martial arts. And there is a lot of techniques over there which help you manage pain and help you relax. And so I said, let's do something. Let's manage my fatigue first. So I started thinking back, doing some of the techniques. And I made up my mind that unless my fatigue was only 3 out of 10, instead of the usual 7 or 8 out of 10, I would not move. Of course, this completely flipped my parents around because for the next three days, I was lying like that, not doing anything. And they were wondering what's going on. But on the third day, when things had settled, I suddenly found that something new was kicking in inside. And as I started doing this again and again, the haziness in my brain started opening up. I had longer windows of cognitive alertness. And my legs started swinging without pain. And this was a revelation, right? Uh, as I started moving and as I started doing the basics of yoga and martial arts again, which is, you know, very targeted muscle-based practice, I started moving from not being able to touch my knees to being able to touch my toes. And when that happened, I found a lot of things about my cognition started changing. My short-term memory got better. I could execute a complex task without forgetting intermediate steps. Uh, I would not go into depression like I used to before completely unexplained, and so on and so forth. And it seemed to be much better than all the medication I had taken so far. And so this incident gave me an insight. I started to realize that mind and matter are actually two sides of the same coin. In many ways, maybe vague, they seem to follow the same principles. And in very weird ways, they seem to behave in a similar manner. I became more and more convinced that what I really needed to understand was the relationship between matter and mind, and not just to exercise my mind over matter. So that was the first part of my story. Let me give you a break from the serious stuff and give you a quiz. OK, so how many of you know who these guys are? Hands up. Anyone? Yes, sir? Descartes. Descartes. Excellent. That's the first one. So he and last one is the Vivekananda. Exactly. And the guy in the middle, Isaac Newton, right? <laughs> so these are not the guys on social media anymore. <laughs> so we won't know that. And the reason I'm doing this is because all three of them were great scientists in their own right. The ones on the left followed the mainstream Western scientific principles, and the person on the right having studied a lot of Western science, applied it very dramatically to the principles of yoga with the same attitude of scientific inquiry that we know as science today. So as you can see, Descartes was in the late 1500s and 1600s followed by Newton and then subsequently followed by Vivekananda. I think for most of us, the most well-known name is the guy in the middle, right? Am I right? Most of us know what Newton did, OK? Descartes was the guy who practically created geometry. He created the Cartesian coordinate system and allowed us to solve algebraic problems using geometry. So really a great guy, made a lot of life simple, especially for guys like me who were hopeless at algebra. Newton we know, right? Uh, and Vivekananda is probably somebody whose works people may not be very familiar with, uh, especially when it came to the study of the human mind. 
And I, I put these three up because I shall, I've taken lessons from the three of them in the evolution of the research journey that we've come across. So somewhere in the 1900s, uh, Newton was facing a lot of trouble, right? You had these other guys coming up with quantum mechanical laws which said that some of his rules don't apply under certain circumstances. So we had Max Planck and Niels Bohr, who you may have heard of, who completely changed how we looked at matter. And then, of course, there's that crazy guy with the tongue out, Mr. Einstein, who said something very beautiful. He said, you can't solve your problems using the same thinking that created it in the first place. I think many of the climate change people, et cetera, will agree with that, right? And then we have somebody who is relatively unknown. Uh, that's Satyendranath Bose. He is an Indian scientist. He was one of the guys who proposed a correction to the Einstein equation. They came up with the Einstein condensate. And now, of course, the smallest, most fundamental particle called boson is named after him. So Newton was really unvalidated. And when that happened, uh, I started doing my research, and I was looking at what the mind is saying. And we found that hmm, Western science is saying something about the mind, as you can see over there. And then the yoga text and the Eastern philosophies were saying that mind has some other number of parts, four parts and four subparts, which means 16 parts. Really, uh, this made no sense to me. I said, look, I'm trying to understand the mind, but I really want to find a way of representing it in a simple manner. And then as I was doing my studies and the PhD had started by then, I came across this very beautiful concept proposed by Vivekananda, and I will just point you to the last one. You may call the mind a subtle body, or the body as concentrated mind. This kicked off something, and it related me to something that I knew very well, which is Newton's laws. And so I said, can this apply to Newton's laws? And so Newton's law says the body continues in a state of rest or uniform motion, unless acted upon by external force. Anybody having trouble? getting the children to clean their rooms? <laughs> yeah. So habit is that uniform state of motion or rest, all right? Similarly, this change is proportional to the force and will be in the direction of its application, right? So depending on where you want to navigate your habits, you have to do it consistently, and the more forcefully you do it with the appropriate force, those changes happen. And lastly, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So we know if I'm upset, if I'm angry, blood pressure goes up, sugar goes crazy, and so on and so forth. So it seemed to apply. And this made a lot of sense to me with my limited knowledge of other things and my love for Newton's laws. And so it was very clear that a new paradigm was emerging. And that's not the mind-body distinction of Descartes, but the mind-body synergy, which now Newton helped explain to me in a simple manner. Then when I looked at the brain, I saw, wow, people are talking about neuroplasticity. So brain is not hardwired anymore. It's ever changing. And that seemed to really fit in nicely with this synergy. This did an amazing thing. Suddenly, all the abilities in the disabled people we, was, we were working with seemed to emerge, come to the surface. So we found many physically disabled are cognitive, many cognitive disabled are mobile. Some people work better with physical work. Some people work better with mental work. And this sort of related completely to my own personal experience. And we started doing this brain physio approach, which is the fundamental new technology that we are proposing to the world, to the medical world. It's a wearable device. And it follows a method where we engage brain and body together. Today's technology allows you to look inside and solve we are reacting, whether we are reacting in a flight mode or a fight mode or in the right way. And then it allows you to train to respond in an appropriate manner, leaving behind all those subconscious reactions. You spoke about narratives and so on and so forth. And so this is our technology. It's called Symphony. It's a set of wearable devices. It captures time-synchronized brain and muscle signals, enables me able to self-correct movements, relaxation, and attention in real time. And hence, recover from stroke, injury, childhood developmental delay, learning, disability, or aging, and get back to independent living. So do visit that website if you want to know more about this. I just leave you with the last slide. 
to, for all the students over here, I really, really have come to believe as a late life, late in life academic, that new knowledge must begin from first principles. Don't make science a superstition, okay? If you want to explore science, look at all fields of work. Science is not cast in stone. Sometimes very old research is the new new. And of course, when it comes to rules of good health, when your mind does not work, jump up, use your body. And when you feel your body is unhealthy, don't forget to use your mind. Thank you.